Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, on the 4th of November, 2016. And this is another edition of the somewhat gone but probably forgotten uh, episode of the Asia-Pacific Perspective series that I do with my co-host, Brock West, who is usually introduced as being of APPerspective.net, although he is... I don't know if better known or at least uh, more occupied with his work as video editor for CorbettReport.com and now also video editor for NewsBud.com. Before we start, Brock, why don't you just update people on APPerspective.net? Yes, James, good to be back. And um, as the viewers may or may not have noticed, uh, my website, APPerspective.net, is pretty much defunct now. Um, As you said, I'm far too busy editing for the Corbett Report and NewsBud these days to maintain the site. So... Unfortunately, rest in peace, APPerspective.net, but we'll be sure to uh, keep bringing you AP updates when we can find the time, just like we have today. So um, although we haven't done an episode of APP for a while now, it doesn't mean that there aren't major developments happening all across the Asia-Pacific. And in this episode, I hope we'll show that while in some cases it may seem that the American pivot to Asia is not going quite according to plan, I think we'll see that we are still inching ever closer to future turmoil in the region. So our first story comes from the always invaluable Land Destroyer report, James, with the headline reading, US attempts to shame Asia for caving to China. It is becoming clear that US influence, despite its pivot towards Asia, is waning across the Asia Pacific region. Washington has suffered geopolitical setbacks in virtually every nation in the Asia Pacific, including those now led by regimes it has meticulously organized, funded and backed for decades. It is also waning, however, among those nations considered long-time and crucial U.S. allies. However, in reality, Thailand has incrementally dismantled American influence over it and has diversified its trade and cooperation with a large variety of nations, including China, as a means of depending on ties with no single nation in particular. Thailand's economic trade is focused primarily within Asia, with majority of its imports and exports divided equally between China, Japan and ASEAN, with the West collectively representing a smaller, though not insignificant, market. Asia's transformation was entirely predictable, and despite the fact that the United States attempted to contain China and preserve its influence throughout the rest of Asia, it did so by ignoring the fundamentals of economics and socio-political factors and instead focused on coercion through trade deals, compromising military alliances, and the creation and perpetuation of artificial strategies of tension both within targeted nations and between Asian states. Now, James, while at face value, this may seem like a positive development that Asian nations are seemingly turning their economic backs on the US, let's not forget that the majority of nations in the Asia Pacific are either already signatories or uh, signatories of the TPP or have indicated that they will become part of it in the near future. And this includes Thailand with Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha stating back in March that Thailand will have to join the TPP eventually, which, as we all know, gives the major transnational corporations all the power and control over the region that they'll ever need. James? You're exactly right about that. I mean, there is a web of treaties and agreements and alliances that already exist in this region that already firmly ensconce much of the region within the U.S. orbit. So that is already a a fait accompli in many ways. And I think the other aspect of this is that we tend to fall into the enemy of my enemy is my friend or the friend of my enemy is my enemy or whatever, that that kind of thinking very easily along these lines. Because you can look at things like what's going on in Hong Kong right now. You have um, some of the, uh, the, the kind of umbrella protest uh, movement uh, outgrowth has actually got seats in the Hong Kong legislature now, and there's, they're causing ruckus and uh, trying to agitate for separation from China. And there's no doubt there is some outside U.S. Uh, corporate influence in movements like that to try to stir the pot and to get things um, kicked off. But that doesn't mean that the people of Hong Kong don't have genuine grievances with China. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be supportive of movements that genuinely reflect a genuine interest of the people to get away from tyrannies of whatever sort. Um, Now, obviously, that has to be done in an intelligent manner, and it can't be just uh, done, you know, willy-nilly, but it leaves... I think when we start to try to decide, okay, which is the good guy and which is the bad guy here and what side should we be on, it's it, it's not quite as black and white as 
some people would like to portray it, that um, anything that has any sort of influence from the outside is therefore automatically tainted. Well, then that's an easy way of tainting any any genuine freedom movement, isn't it? And then also on the flip side of that, you have places like the Philippines, where people are following Duterte and what's going on there. And he's some sort of savior because he's trying to extricate the Philippines from the U.S. influence. A, I mean... The way that he does that is not necessarily a good thing, and if he does that in a bad way, that can still be as bad for the people of the Philippines as simply being vassal state of the United States. And secondarily, it seems like it's a lot of hype and bluster that he'll make these big pronouncements that get reported all over, oh, he's stepping away from the U.S., etc. Whereas, meanwhile, at the lower level, every all of the foreign secretary and all of the diplomats and everyone still maintain their good relations with the United States. Everyone at that level, the, when you actually read the foreign policy people, they say, no, there's there's really no, no disruption going on here. It's just the president coming out and making these crazy statements and then kind of backtracking on them later. And that doesn't get as much press. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that's a lot of kind of smoke and mirrors and distraction and, hey, look over here. Whereas, it, as always, reality is much more complicated. So it is not a straightforward thing. And I think you're right. This is not a happy story. It's not a necessarily bad story. It's just that there's a lot going on right now. And yes, the Asia Pacific pivot that the US has been trying to go to for seven years now certainly is not going according to plan. And it is not where I imagine they wanted it to be. But as I wrote recently uh, in the leaked Goldman Sachs speeches from Hillary Clinton, she definitely still thinks about the South China Sea and and this area, and it's still very important to her. That will definitely be part of a Clinton presidency if and when she is anointed. So there you go. I mean, it's still very much on the tables. It's still very much in play. There's a lot uh, going uh, on, and I just hope people don't necessarily jump on whatever kind of the first bandwagon impulse they have about this or that story, this or that person. It's usually layers more complicated than the, the surface level would have you believe. Yes, exactly. And the the Philippine president is a perfect example of that. While on the surface, he's making all these uh, statements that he's going to withdraw the UN and kick the United States military out of the Philippines. At the same time, he's committing essentially mass murder with the crackdown on drugs in the Philippines. You know, there's been reported upwards of 2,000 to 3,000 people who have been killed under his watch on, on this crackdown. So we're not here explaining that the president, the Philippi- Philippines president is a, is a saint from heaven or anything like that. It's always important to keep an open mind. And with that said, James, in another seemingly positive step, we will move to our second story from a a website called Russia Beyond the Headlines with the headline reading, Moscow, Tokyo, working on a peace treaty draft. Ahead of the visit of Russian President Vladimir Putin to Japan on December 15, Moscow and Tokyo are working on the draft of a peace treaty. Valentina Matvienko, chairwoman of the Federation Council, which is the upper house of the Russian parliament, uh, told this to reporters on November 1st. There have already been a series of consultations at the level of deputy foreign ministers, Matvienko said, adding that she was confident that Russia and Japan could draft a mutually acceptable peace treaty. She said Moscow would not yield to the demands of Tokyo on the transfer of even a few of the South Kuril Islands. Russia's sovereignty over the Kuril Islands is indisputable and a revision of this stance is out of the question, she said. Now, James, if I know one thing, it's that countries in times of increased tensions and perhaps future conflicts even, neither side on the 2D chessboard wants to give an inch to the other. And with Japan continuing to tie itself even closer to the military hegemon over the past few years, as we have reported here on APP, I would have thought that the US and Japan would have continued to fight tooth and nail to keep this ongoing bubbling dispute with Russia about these islands simmering simmering away for as long as possible. So it's an interesting development at any rate, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts on it. Well, you are right. I mean, it does seem to be contrary to the overall trend. And before Matt Vienko came out and shut down the, the idea, it was being reported or at least floated that maybe, just maybe, they were, they were going to finally settle the, uh, the, the dispute over what Japan calls the Northern Territories, what Russia calls the Southern Kurils, um, and that the, uh, the idea that was being floated was that uh, Russia was going to cede it to Japan on the condition that they would not let the U.S. military in that area, which is interesting. But that whole idea was just kiboshed, uh, apparently, by the chairwoman of the Federation Council. So apparently that's not even on the table. I'll believe it when I see it anyway. Um, It's interesting to see what kind of peace treaty can or would be drafted 
if unless the sovereignty of those islands is is settled i mean i think that's that is the sticking point um why are they still arguing about world war ii it's because of these islands right so I don't know. I mean, I'd, uh, and just to put further brakes on the idea, um, uh, just last week, Putin himself came out and said that uh, he is opposed to setting any sort of time limit on uh, a peace treaty. He was asked if uh, if they'd be able to, to close the deal within the next few months. And he said he's not going to put a time limit on it. And um, it's harmful to determine any time limits. So I don't know. I think it might be a, a little bit of hype, but at, that it's even being talked about is interesting, as you say, because it does sort of go against the, the prevailing tendencies in the region. But it is one of those things where it makes it makes all sorts of sense on paper. I mean, of course, for the economic benefits alone, Russia and Japan should have better relations and should be trading. And Putin will be attending a uh, economic forum when he's in Tokyo. Uh, it is going to be a major. Uh, visit and we'll probably see some some economic ties uh, being generated from this uh, just out from Japan Times. Russia, Japan way priority projects for economic cooperation. You have economic and energy ministers fleshing out dozens of specific projects in the two countries for economic cooperation over the next month. So clearly there's a lot on the table and I think they might be looking at this more in the economic sphere than in the military sphere, and it'll be interesting to see what kinds of pressures the U.S. might apply to uh, to try to put the brakes on that. And if and when, again, if, if Clinton gets anointed and Cold War 2.0 is back on the table, I mean, that will seriously change the, the type of political calculus, at any rate, that Tokyo would have in relation to Russia. So it's all coming at an interesting timing. Uh, we'll definitely know more next month when the visit actually happens, I guess. Yeah, one can only hope for this kind of at least incremental positive step, perhaps towards the Senkaku slash Diaoyu Islands there in the in the East China Sea. Um, but I, I think there's much more at stake underneath those islands that that are both sides are willing to let on yet. So I can't see those islands in particular uh, uh, cooling cooling off anytime so, soon. Although I did see a uh, recently an article, uh, Japan and China are actually going to con- conduct some joint military exercises in the region. So it'll be interesting to see. What happens there? <clears throat> so, James, our first two stories had some kind of positive aspects, maybe, to them. But as we'll see with our final story here, when it comes to the Asia Pacific military industrial complex, however, it's always business as u- usual. We'll take our final story from the creatively named news.com.au with the headline reading Australia open to conducting joint exercises with Indonesia in South China Sea. Last week, Indonesian Defence Minister suggested that Indonesia and Australia conduct joint military patrols in the South China Sea. According to the Jakarta Post, Mr Riamizad met with Australia's Foreign Minister Julie Bishop and Defence Minister Maurice Payne on Thursday last week to make the proposal. Quote, we have already suggested to Australia the possibility of conducting joint patrols in the eastern part of the South China Sea. We are sure that we will soon create a plan on how to realise it. They have more or less agreed, he told reporters on Friday. He said he believed the joint patrols would help bring peace to the disputed region. Peace to the disputed region. It's a popular line, isn't it? Uh, I I recall way back in 2001, 2002, when then Crime Minister John Howard lied to us all about Australia's need to send our military men and women off to slaughter in Iraq and Afghanistan. Of course, under the illusion of bringing peace, stability and security to that particular region. Fifteen years on, I want all Aussies here to ask yourself, is there peace? Is there stability? Is there security in those regions? I think that answer is fairly self-evident. How many times are we going to allow ourselves to be led into these imperialist wars? How many more lives of our service men and women and innocent human beings are we prepared to watch be snuffed out for all the sick ideologies of the powers that shouldn't be? We must break our conditioning that engaging in these and future wars will somehow make us safer and more secure. Ever since Secretary of State Clinton's announcement of America's pivot to Asia way back in 2011, we and all, all the people of the Asia Pacific have been at a crossroad, and, it is to- and time is beginning to run short for all of us to find a way to stand up peacefully but firmly and resist any and all actions by the criminals in power around our region. So there's my little spiel, James. You got a, Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, only a, a, a potentially bright spot of happiness, <laughs> or at least not so much doom and gloom, is that Bring it on. <laughs> for what it's worth, I don't think that they are actually going to start a military confrontation with China. 
Um, I think that this is a lot for for show for a lot of different reasons, including feeding the military industrial complex beast, and also for the uh, the 3D ge- uh, geopolitical chess reasons that I've outlined when talking about China and the New World Order. But certainly, I mean, the rhetoric is there, um, and the military exercises and the military deployments take place, whether it's intended to be used for war or not. So it maybe it amounts to the same thing. And this this article that you're pointing to. <laughs> It links to a rather remarkable article from the Global Times, which is one of the many mouthpieces of the Chinese uh, media. And I will suggest people read it because it's quite, it's quite something else. It's called Paper Cat Australia Will Learn Its Lesson. It was from July of this year, and I hadn't even seen it at the time. But it goes, uh, it, it's talking about the, uh, the, the disputes over the South China Sea and the, the arbitration uh, tribunal that came out with its ruling earlier this year that China rejected and Australia supports. And it ends by saying Australia is not even a paper tiger. It's only a paper cat at best. At a time when its former caretaker country, the UK, is dedicated to developing relations with China, and almost the whole of Europe takes a neutral position, Australia has unexpectedly made itself a pioneer of hurting China's interests with a fiercer attitude than countries directly involved in the South China Sea dispute. But this paper cat won't last. I mean, that's a pretty remarkable statement, essentially coming from the Chinese government, I mean, via via its mouthpiece proxy, and uh, not in very diplomatic language. That's the type of rhetoric that we are dealing with at this point. Clearly, um, I mean, clearly the the hype and the tension is there. And as we've talked about before, even if there isn't necessarily the plan to start a military confrontation, when you start deploying forces in military exercises and in, in preparation and watchfulness and all that, all it takes is one hothead on one wrong day in one bad situation to start a, a military confrontation that becomes very real very quickly. So... I think you're exactly right to the people of Australia and all the people in this region generally. Uh, Is this really where we want this to go? Do we really want to start some kind of major international conflagration over a patch of sea? Um, I I, I don't think so. I think there are better ways of dealing with this. And I think that we uh, we have to start finding those better ways of dealing with it before it becomes too late. Absolutely. And I, I don't even think it needs some kind of hothead to do it. Well, I mean, we, you just need to go back to the Gulf of Tonkin incident. You know, it, it can easily be created as well, as we all know. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to do it for this uh, for this month, this year's episode of APP, James. Just on a quick deprogramming note, um, I am working uh, part time as a video production editor for Newsbud.com. And we are in the middle of our second uh, Kickstarter fundraising campaign. So any viewers out there who haven't gone to that yet, and uh, and if you can, please consider supporting us. And also, I want to direct people again to the Corbett Report Extras channel. Um, you and I have been doing a lot of work there to get uh, to revitalize some of the old podcasts and, and, and give them uh, some new light. And uh, I'm really proud of how they're turning out. And hopefully, um, people are finding it a valuable resource. All right, mate. Thank you as always. And um, yeah, let's do it again when we can soon. All right. Take care.